prayed, as we read the word of God, we don't want it to disturb the service. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 to 9, and it reads, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity. Verse 4 says, to give subtility to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. Verse 5, a wise man will hear. Notice, a wise man will hear. But that man is just generic for mankind. So ladies, you're included. A wise man will hear and will increase learning. The man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsel. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise, their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Let me say that again. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools, fools despise wisdom and instruction. A fool will not listen to wisdom and instruction. My son, Hear the instructions of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. But they shall be an ornament of grace unto thy head, and chains about thy neck. We're going to pray. And this is our last session, and I'm sure we'll bring it up again down the line. The Book of Instructions, Part 4. And if we had the subtitle, it would be, Don't. Reject wisdom. Don't reject wisdom. Can you tell that to yourself instead of your neighbor? Say, don't. Come on, let's more than 10 of us in here. Let's say it one more time. Don't reject wisdom. Let us pray. Father, we love you. And we thank you for everything that you've done for us. Allowing us to be here today in the house of the Lord. We ask that you will teach us tonight, God. Many said that they were going to press their way here. Lord God, we don't know what's wrong, but I pray that they're safe. But I pray that God, we remember, the only way to grow in the house of God is to be in the house of God. How can we hear without a preacher? Lord, I thank you for the true word of God. I thank you for salvation. Teach us tonight from your word that we can grow and have wisdom. That we can know what you require of us if we really, truly want to be saved. No more, God, of doing things on our own, but we are to trust in you and trust in the scriptures. We ask that you help us tonight. Teach us tonight. Help us to be, Lord God, to walk up right before you. We love you, and I bind every spirit of distraction, every sleepiness that will come over us right now as we're about to learn the word of God. Lord, wake us up, and Lord God, at the end of the day, trouble the waters of baptism. Touch somebody's heart to give their life truly over to you. That, Lord, they'll go down in the name of Jesus. That they'll repent from their sins and turn away from this world and their mindset and their ways. That they will be filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost as you poured it out, God, in the New Testament. We give you the glory, honor, and praise in Jesus' mighty name. Can we clap our hands unto God as we're being seated? And can somebody just shout out one more time, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah. The book of instructions. And again, this is part four. And to all of those that are listening or hearing it for the first time tonight, we say to you, you can go back to the social media platforms and you're able to look at part three and part two, and the intro of part one. So that way you can get some understanding if you were not here. Because there may be some things that you're asking or might ask. And a lot of it maybe have been answered in the last sessions. So we say to you, please go back to those platforms, whether it be Facebook or Instagram or YouTube. You can look at the message to see part three, two, and one. Tonight we're dealing with part four. We're talking about the book of instructions. This is a book, as we read from the Word of God, that mostly was written by a man, King Solomon. 
as we read from the scripture, it is King David's son. King Solomon is the one that was assigned to the throne to rule over Israel as a united kingdom before it was split. The book of Proverbs, what does it do when you read the book of Proverbs? I'm going to say it again. Anytime somebody asks me, what book should I read? Where should I start? Well, besides in the book of Acts, of Acts 238, with the plan of salvation, of how to get into the kingdom of God, I will tell them once they come on in, I will tell them, read the book of Proverbs. Read the book of Proverbs to the young man, to the young ladies, and even to the elder. Read the book of Proverbs. For what reason? It gives you order in your life. It gives you structure and guidance, direction, and it allows the reader to receive wise counsel every day of their life. But as for the saints, you that are saved, you that are in the house of God, for the saints, we need to read this for what reason? We need order and continue instructions in our life. Understand, we understand that the word of God, when you read it, it gives us instruction. It gives us correction. Uh, not only the book of Proverbs, but all the word of God gives us godly wisdom. This is why Paul tells us when he's talking to Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, he says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is inspired by God. You get people saying, well, I'm going to do only what's in red. Understand, they're saying that because they're saying, I'm only going to do what Jesus said in red. But it's not just what's in red. Jesus never wrote anything in the book, but he gave it to people to write. He used Jews and he used a Gentile. It came from the prophets. It came from Moses. It came from those who wrote the books of the prophets. It came from the Torah that Moses wrote. And so he gave it to man. That's how we have the word of God today. So all scripture is given by God. It's inspired by God. And what is it used for? Notice, and it is profitable for doctrine. Doctrine or certain teaching. Notice, for reproof. It is there to reproof you and what else? Correct you. That if you're doing something wrong, the word of God will correct you. If you're not living right or living holy as he wants you to live, it will correct you. This is why sometimes you can come to church, and by the time you leave, you feel like somebody's cutting you. You feel like somebody's talking about you. You feel like somebody said something about you. But no, the Word of God is there to touch each one of our lives, no matter where you are and what your background, what you did yesterday, and what you did right up to the time it started for service. So it's there to correct us, watch, for instruction in righteousness. Notice, in righteousness. Whose righteousness? His righteousness. God's righteousness. And so this is why coming to church is very important. This is why you sitting at home is not good when the doors are open in the house of God. This is why it's not good to go out to West Palm Beach and have fun or do this when the doors are open. Hear what I'm trying to tell you. This is why it's not good to just sit at home after it's been a long day. If you gave your time to the world, you gave your time to the job, why can't you give a little time, an hour and a half to God? Does that make sense what I'm saying in Jesus' name? But we always are asking God to do something. Bless me, Lord. Give to me, Lord. Give me this, God. But God says, you want me to come to your house, but why won't you come to mine? Why won't you come and hear what I want you to do or how I want you to live? Or why is it when you come to the house of God, you get this whole sleepy spirit that come over you? I mean, you're so tired. Your eyes are telling you they're going against you. They're like, no, we're going to shut. You said, no, you got to open. But the eyes that said, no, shut. Why is that? 
because your flesh does not want you here. Your flesh does not want you to hear. Your flesh does not want you to understand the word of God. Your flesh does not want you to be saved. Your flesh wants you to go lay up with your boyfriend, take your family to West Palm Beach. Your flesh want to sit at home. Your flesh want to sit and say, it's been a long day, but the devil is a lie. Tell your flesh to wake up and hear the word of God. So the book, the book, the Biblos, the Bible, it gives us correction. It gives us the wisdom of God. But this particular book, the book of Proverbs, it gives us simple instructions of wisdom for our everyday life. Just simple instructions. If you would just read it, if you would just go through the scriptures, if you would start from chapter 1 and all the way to chapter 31, then I'm telling you, people of God, you can learn some instructions and wisdom for your everyday life. Notice a few instructions or wisdom that we haven't gone over in the last sessions. Uh, things like Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. Let's go through them really quick. I'm going to put this one in the Amplified Version. You that are watching live, you will be able to see it as well. But I hope that there's no saints sitting at home watching it live when you know you should be here. Yes, this is a church that will hold you accountable, Christian, Christ follower. You should be in the house of God. But the Bible says in Proverbs, the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12, notice, we're going to learn some wisdom and some instructions from the book. The Bible says, hatred stirs up strife, but love covers and overwhelms all transgressions. Notice, forgiving and overlooking another's faults. Saints of God, this is great, great wisdom to have. When you can stop trying to point fingers at everybody else, and you just kind of overlook their faults. Because watch this. You got faults too. There's some good instructions and wisdom for us. So you can take your eyes off everybody else. And think about what you have done. And how you are living. And if I'm living right with God. Is God okay with my lifestyle. And my decisions. And my choices. Great wisdom when I read this. Which is why Peter tells us. In the New Testament. That love covers a multitude of. Of sin. This is why saints of God, you got to have enough love in your heart to cover a multitude of sins. This is why sometimes when you come into church, people get hurt out there in the world. But when they come into the house of God, they got to feel love. If you've been going through tragic things out there in the world, when you come in, you don't want to get hurt when you come up in here. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Now, the only thing that's going to hurt us is going to be the word of God. That's the only thing that will cut you, but the word of God knows how to heal you as well. Does that make sense what I'm saying? It knows how to heal you. We're trying to make this thing simple. By the time you leave here tonight, I promise you, you're going to say, I learned something from that church. And so when you go to Proverbs chapter 10, verse 22, notice what the Bible says. The blessings of the Lord, it maketh rich and addeth no sorrow with it. What does that mean? The blessings of the Lord make it rich. It added no sorrow. Listen to the wisdom and the instruction to this. The blessings of the Lord, when God blesses you, is not going to bring sorrow to your life. If it came from God, it's going to be a blessing. But if it didn't come from him, you're going to try to do everything you can to hold on to it. You're going to do everything. You're going to scam. You're going to miss this. You're going to do this. But when it comes to God, God gives you and it adds no sorrow to your life. This is why I tell the ladies, if that's the man that God wants you to have, he ain't going to be smacking you around cheating on you. Does that make sense what I'm saying? Brothers, if that's the lady, then God will let you know and get yourself together. And it won't be something contrary to the word of God. It will be a blessing and not sorrow. If it's a job, God wants you to be in the house of God. So he's not giving you a job. Watch this. That you will never be able to be in the house of God consistently. It didn't come from God. The devil know how to bless too. So if he wants to keep you out, here's a six-figure job. Now we take it and say, won't he do it? Won't he do it? Why don't they do it? But your soul is going to the lake of fire. Your soul is going to the lake of fire. Because you're not learning. You're not knowing what God is requiring of you. Because you're so busy trying to make money. The blessings of the Lord make it rich. 
and it has no sorrow. This is why I look at Proverbs chapter 11, 28. It goes with it. Make, put it in the Amplified so we can blow it up. The Bible says, he who leans on and trusts in, watch this, and trusts in and is confident in his riches will what? Will fall. But the righteous who trust in God's provision will flourish like a green leaf. I trust in the Lord. Do you trust in the Lord? Anybody trust in the Lord? I trust in God. I don't trust in my job because they'll lay me off tomorrow. I don't trust in the riches of this world because, watch this, the things that of this world will be soon passed away. But if I trust in God, he is my provider. He is my keeper. He is my healer. I don't trust in the doctors. Does you hear what I'm saying? He's the great physician. I trust in him to heal my body, to keep me and protect me. Come on, somebody. God has been protecting us. God has raised you up. Even if you got sick, you're still here today. Thank God for that. Hallelujah. And so I look at Solomon, other things that he has teaching us regarding instructions and wisdom, especially to the saints of the living God. Things like gossip and malice. Solomon talks about in the Proverbs 16, verse 27 to 29. He says to us, an ungodly man diggeth, watch this, up evil. And in his lips there is as a burning fire. A foreign man sow at strife. Watch this. And a whisperer, a gossiper, separated chief friends. A gossiper would be somebody that would come in and cause division in the house of God. Division in the house of God. Division in the house of God. Division in that ministry. Division in that department. Division in your heart. Understand, a gossiper, a whisperer. 29 says, a violent man entices his neighbor and leadeth him into the way that is not good. You better make sure you watch who's around you. Young people, be careful who you calling your friend. Be careful who you hooking up with. I know you got family members, but everybody in the family ain't saved. Everybody in the family ain't trying to be Bible saved. Let me put it that way. Everybody around you is not trying to be Bible saved. Hear what I'm trying to tell you. Bible saved. I know you got some people that look like they're saved or look like they're Christian, look like they love God, look like they pray, look like they call on Jesus, but they are not Bible saved. And to all of our parents, we learn this. In Proverbs 22, verse 6, the Bible says, you've heard it before, train up a child in the way he should go. That he is generic for, again, talking about just mankind. It's not just boys, but it's to the girls as well. Train up a child in the way he should go. When he is old, he will not depart from it. Train him up, meaning you got to show him. Don't sit there and try to say, well, I'll just tell it to him. But then you try to say, why y'all not listening? You know why they not listening? Because you're not doing it. I'm telling you, you got to come to church just along with your kids. Don't drop by here and pick them and let them sit, come on in and you sitting at the house. No, you got to bring them in here. And I say to you, sit them right next to you so don't sit next to their friend talking. But let them hear what the Bible is saying. If you are sitting at home and you want them to be some good citizens, but you never put God in them or allow them to hear God, but you said, and you read your Bible, but they're not reading the Bible. So why don't you let them come to the house of God so they can learn what they need to do? If you don't want to be saved, I get it. Stay at home then, but bring them so they can have a chance so they can be saved. Does anybody believe that it's still truth if you don't like it anyway? I got more to go. Train up a child. Let your children know it is important not to miss church. Put your, watch this, your birthday over, put your church over your birthday. Let me get it right. Put church over your birthday. Do the birthday next week or on a Saturday, but not on a Sunday, not on a Wednesday. Am I hurting people now? Yeah, man. Amen. Amen. Graduation parties, not on a Sunday. Does that make sense? But we do all this thinking, God okay, he okay with this. No, he not. Who told you that? Show me Bible for that, because I'll show you a whole bunch. 
that he's against it. Does that make sense what I'm saying? We want our children to be filled with the Holy Ghost, but don't pull them out right when they got it. Don't pull them out right when they receive it. Don't pull them out when they get in a connection. You want them to be plugged in all day to it. Why? Because that's the only way they're going to get more of this thing and get a hunger or an appetite for it. So I want the whole family to be here. But in our world today, our children are training themselves. We can see that the parents care less about their children learning more about God. Minds today are so twisted that the way that we function or the way that we believe, watch this, we don't do what God is telling us to do. Our minds are so twisted, we're caught up in so many other things. This is why we must be sober in our minds. This is why I cannot fill up my mind and intoxicate my mind with things of the world. I can't intoxicate my mind with things that the world think is okay. Understand what I'm trying to say. This is why we say to you, this wise man, Solomon, he's somebody that can teach us the importance of being sober as a child of God. Notice, let's look at the definition of this word sober. It is on the monitor for you. When you say I'm sober, what does it mean? I'm not drunk. I'm not intoxicated. I'm clear-headed. Able to correctly judge. Not drinking. Dignified. Steady, I'm level-headed. When you're sober, these are some things you can look at to say, well, yeah, I need to be clear-headed, especially as a child of God. I need to be able to make some correct decisions and judgments. I need to have discernment of what's going on around me. I need to be level-headed, understand. I don't need to be intoxicated. I've had people that talk to me before, and some people have left here because they've asked the question, uh, what's wrong with drinking wine? Many people come and say, what's wrong with drinking wine? On a Friday night, I can't have my bubble bath and my wine. What's wrong with drinking a little wine? Jesus turned water into wine. Jesus didn't drink it. He didn't drink it. Go back and read it. He didn't drink it. And if you want to get into what the whole wine, we can talk about it. From the grapevine, we can talk about it. But understand, there's no way that you can be sober when you tipsy. There's no way that you can be sober with a little, watch this. Now, your alcohol level, watch this. You might say, oh, I can handle it. You might say, I'm cool. You know why you cool? Because your alcohol level is up at a certain point. But saints of God, you should have no alcohol level. You should have no alcohol level. There should be no alcohol inside of your system. So let's look at a few scriptures on this, this sober mind in it. We can learn from the book of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 20, verse 1. Put this one in the Amplified and we'll go further. The Bible says, wine is a mocker. Strong drink, a riotous brawl. And whoever is intoxicated by it is not wise. Oh, you're not wise when you're drinking wine. Go ahead and say it. <laughs> it's just at a candlelight dinner. You ain't wise. You know, people want to slip in things like, what about this? What about this? What about this? What about being holy? See, that's why we say when you come to a church like this, uh, we're not trying to nickel and dime you. We ain't trying to take no money. This ain't no prosperity church. This is a church that preached from the Bible. This is why it's on the monitors. This is why they can watch it. We'll put it in the KJV, the Amplify, the NLT. This is where the church where you can come to be saved. Now, if you want to play church like they play house when they were little, we did play church. But this ain't no church where we play. We keep it real according to the word of God. We want to be saved. We got to be holy because he says he is holy. But if you want to play, we'll play. Put up a church, Ebenezer, whatever you want to call it. Put it up. Put a cross out there on it. But this ain't no, this ain't that church. This ain't no community center. You hear what I'm saying? I'm not asking you what's some good ideas we need to do. No, you don't, I don't need no ideas. Let's come from the word of God. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So if you go to a church, 
The first thing you need to pay attention to, hear me, my sister and my brother. If you go to another church, you think I'm coming at you. I'm not. But if you go to a church, the first thing you want to know, are they preaching, telling me how I am to be saved? How do I get into the kingdom or into heaven? If they never told you that, then you got to come out of that place. Now they can talk to you about mercy, grace, forgiveness, love. They can talk to you about that. But the number one important thing is you got to know how to get to heaven. You got to know how to get to glory. If they have not told you to repent, if they have not told you to be baptized in the name of Jesus, if they have not told you that you needed the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues like they got it from the book on the day of Pentecost on what the apostles preached to the world, then you need to come out of that church. Many have come and been baptized here, but go back to their false church, come out from among them, and be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and he will receive you. So God has you here tonight for a reason, for you to hear. But once you leave, you can reject the instructions and the wisdom and walk away. But you have heard. I didn't come to be your friend. I just came to preach. I understand many may not like me, but I love you and I want you to be saved. Bible saved. Can we clap our hands unto that in Jesus' name? And so he goes more into this thing. He digs deeper regarding this subject on this whole sober thing. In Proverbs 23, verse 29 to 35, notice what the Bible says. Make it simple for us in the NLT that everybody can understand. He says, who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who is always fighting? You know anybody like that? Who always fighting? Cursing. Talking about like, do it again. Do it again. Don't hold me back. Who, you know anybody like that? Don't hold me back, Connor Shay. Let Jimmy let me go. You know anybody like that? Okay. Who has anguish? Who has sorrow? Who, who's always fighting? Who, who is always complaining? Who has unnecessary bruises? Watch where we're going. Who has bloodshot eyes? You know anybody like that? You know any deacons like that? Hmm? After church, you know any deacons that got bloodshot eyes? And they the deacons? Verse 20, go ahead, go to verse 30. Notice what the Bible says. It is the one who spends long hours in the taverns trying out new drinks. You want to know the one that always has anguish? You want to know the one that has sorrow and complaint? It is the one that is always at the pubs or the bars or the clubs trying out new drinks. Which one is this one? Is this the tequila? Is this that rum, that white rum? Can you add a little ice to this? That's that one. The one with the red cup sitting out in the back behind the church. The deacon. Don't gaze at the wine, it says, seeing how red it is, how it, it sparkles in the cup, how smoothly it goes down. Verse 32, for in the end, it bites like a poisonous snake. It stings like a viper. You see, watch, you will see hallucinations. You will see or you will cry or say crazy things when you drunk, when you tipsy, when you on that wine, when you intoxicated. You will stagger like a sailor tossed at the sea, clinging to sway at a mast. In verse 35, and you will say, they hit me. But I didn't even feel it. Listen, I didn't make this up. It's right there. I'm not putting on no show for y'all. Look at it. Look, read it. And I'm going to read it like this. And you will say, they hit me, but I didn't feel it because you intoxicated. I didn't even know it when they beat me up. I didn't know that he smacked me. I didn't know that it was a domestic violence. I didn't know. Why? Because we always drunk in this house. When will I wake up so I can look for another drink? 
Here's, this is in the Bible, all right? I'm just showing it another version so you can understand it. That's all. That's all I'm doing. I'm not taking none out of context. Go back. Just go read it yourself. You hear what I'm trying to tell you? The only translation that we don't use all these translations, and I'm not going to go to no Greek and Hebrew because none of us speak Hebrew and Greek. Does that make sense what I'm saying? But when you leave here, you'll have a clear understanding. This is why we hear King Lemuel giving these words to the people who are in leadership. This is why saints of God, we are in leadership. You say, how? We are supposed to be a witness. We are Christ, watch this, followers. We are Christ representative. We are Christ ambassadors. Christ is looking for us to watch this, uh, to be his witness and to tell and to testify who he is, that he is holy. Watch this. He's set apart. He's not like the world. So Christ wants children of God to be sober-minded. And we are the king's children. Anybody is the king's children? We are the king of king's children. We are his sons and his daughters. Uh, come on, my brother. Uh, we are his sons and his daughters. Uh, we got to be sober-minded. Uh, we got to have the wisdom. Uh, we got to have the instruction to let the world know you can't live like that. You can't do that. You can't live like that. You can't shack up. You can't walk around. You can't do this. Uh, you got to be saved. Come on. Repent for your sins uh, and go down in Jesus' name. Uh, come to the truth. Uh, come to the house of God where your soul can hear truth and be saved. So King Lemuel comes in and says it in Proverbs 31, verse 4 to 5. Put it in the Amplified as we're learning. It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine or for rulers to desire strong drink. Otherwise, they drink and forget. Watch. You drink and you forget. Watch the law and its decrees and prevent the rights and the justice of all the afflicted. When you're not in your right mind, you're forgetting the word of God. When you're not in your right mind, you don't remember what you learned on Wednesday night. When you're not in your right mind, when the fight break out, watch this, you're going to be all in your flesh instead of remember what God said you should do. When your boss does something, you're going to go off on the bus and off on the boss rather and get fired, forgetting what you should do in that situation. you got to be sober. Can you tell your neighbor, be sober? Tell them one more time. They didn't hear you say, be sober. If there's anybody that should tell us this, it's the man by the name of Solomon who had all of these wives. Because he was allowing his wives to intoxicate him. And there's an intoxication, watch this, naturally and spiritually. You can be intoxicated naturally and spiritually. This is why saints of God, we got to make sure that how we live is very important because you can intoxicate yourself with the things of this world. That's why he's telling us to come out. He's telling us not to get involved. He's telling us not to love this world. But the more you intoxicate yourself with the things of the world, then watch your whole walk with God. It's going to be stagnant. Your whole walk with God, you're going to be up and down like a drunk. Your whole walk with God, you're going to be in and out. Your whole walk with God, you're not going to know when the enemy is coming coming or creeping upon you unaware. But when you are sober-minded, you can see the devil far away and you can begin to plead the blood of Jesus. You can cover your children. Come on, somebody. You can cover your mind when that lustful spirit come around, when that Jezebel come around. You can cover yourself, ladies, when that brother is coming around, when somebody is trying to come into that marriage, you can be covered. But if you're not sober-minded, you're going to fall for anything. So we are intoxicated by the customs and the trends and the traditions of this world. Intoxicated by music. Things that you listen to. You love your R&B. Love the old school. I always bring this up because saints are still struggling in this area. You struggle with the intoxication of Hollywood. Struggle about what you're watching. Hard to get off the pornography. Saints struggle with. Brothers struggle with. Husbands, wives struggling with. Social media, everything that comes on. TikTok, children are picking it up. Killing themselves from what they saw on TikTok. Intoxication. And then we're intoxicated by, this is to me the worst, false preachers and false churches, snakes and serpents coming in with new teachings, things that was not teach, taught in the word of God, 
saying it's okay or it don't take all of that. That bald-headed preacher, that's a cult. He don't know what he's talking about. I wouldn't go back there no more. The devil is alive. The reason why you're here, because God orchestrated your life to come here so you can get away from that snake, from that serpent, from that false church, from that false teaching, from that intoxication. This is why the New Testament apostle says in 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 8 and 9, be sober, notice, be vigilant. Why? Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Who resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same affliction are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. These are all the instructions that can help us in our godly walk so that we can please the Lord. So let me give you a definition of instructions one more time. Getting ready to get out of here, but I'm going to just give you a little bit more. What does instructions mean? A direction or order. Information telling how something should be done, operated, or assembled, put together. How it should be done, the way it should be done. A command, a decree, a mandate, dictate, requirement, demand, charge, or a ruling. And so tonight, let's hear this tonight. I think we should come from this one. We must desire righteousness. Saints of God, you and I must desire righteousness you have to desire truth and righteousness it has to be above all if you do not desire righteousness if you do not desire truth then the devil will give you anything and you will accept it but it has to be righteousness not yours and mine his righteousness understand it got to be true it cannot be a little bit of truth it got to be all because if I tell you a little bit of truth but a little bit of lies in there, watch this, it's still a lie. So if you go to a church or you visit a church, whether it be here, South Bay, Pahokee, Canal Point, wherever it is, wherever you travel, if it's a little bit of lie, it's all a lie. So if you've never heard about baptism and you got here and you heard about baptism in the name of Jesus, I'm telling you, you can't go back to the preacher thinking he's going to change it. No, God brought you to hear it so you can be saved correctly. Do not go back there. Come out from them. You say you're trying to build up your church. It ain't my church. It's his church. And all I did was I came here to the Glade area. I'm not from the Glade area, but I came all the way here from the Midwest to do what? To give God's word so that people can understand so their souls can be saved. If you don't want to be saved, then rock on with your bad self. But there's somebody that wants the word of God. Somebody that wants truth. They're tired of this world and what the devil has been trying to do. So you must desire righteousness. So Solomon says in Proverbs 13, notice what it says, verse 1. Make it simple and we'll go down. We won't go through all of it, but we'll go. Watch what it says. A wise child accepts a parent's discipline. Who's my father? Jesus. A wise child accepts a parent's discipline. A mocker refuses to listen to correction. Wise words will win you a good meal. A treacherous people. Have an appetite for violence. Remember that. Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. You ever been around that before? When you got to tell somebody, would you just be quiet? But, but I got to say something. Would you just be quiet? But I just need to say, would you just be quiet? Don't say nothing. But I got to let them know, don't play with me. Don't say nothing. I got to let them know that I'm the wrong one. Don't say nothing. And then you come back and say, Pastor, can you help me? I got fired. What you say? I told you don't say nothing. But we be thinking we know stuff. Tell your neighbor, keep your mouth shut. And don't say nothing. Control your tongue. This is good instructions. Amen. Clap your hands to that. I mean, this is very, very good. Very good. Good instructions. Just don't say nothing. You know, don't, don't say nothing. Wives, you ain't got to get into no attitude with your husband. Just don't say nothing. You hear what I'm telling you? Brothers, too, too. If one wants to argue, just let them talk. And when they say, did you hear me? You say, huh, you want some chicken? You can't argue by yourself. You know what I'm saying? You can't argue by yourself. 
So I keep my mouth shut so I don't say nothing because I don't want God to judge me on the words that I say because everything that we say and do, you're going to be held accountable for it. So just tell your neighbor one more time. Keep your mouth shut. Amen to that. I like, I like the Bible. Anybody like the Bible? I love the word of God. Amen. Clap your hands one more time. I love it, sis. I love it. Amen. Wow. I, I see things and I'll be like, whoa. I wish I'd have known this a long time ago. You know, we can't even talk. I wish I'd have known this. I wish I'd have known this a long time ago. Ooh, this has kept me out of some stuff. Verse 5 to 6 says, put it in the Amplified. A righteous man hates lies, but a wicked man is lawful, and he acts shamefully. Righteousness, being in the right standing with God, what does it do? Guards the one whose way is blameless. Wickedness undermines and overthrows the sinner. And so I look at this word that many may not talk about, and I talked about it in Bible study, this word called deception. Looking at the time, deception, we got to go. What does the word deception mean? Well, the act of causing someone to accept as true or valid what is false and invalid. It's the act of causing someone to accept as truth or watch this or valid what is false or invalid. The act of deceiving someone, fraudulence, trickery, slyness, cunning, craftiness. That's how that devil is when you read it in the book of Genesis. Look at the instructions or the instruction regarding people that are deceptive or wicked and how we are not to put confidence in them. Notice what Solomon says in Proverbs 25, 19. Make it simple. Putting confidence in unreliable persons. In times of trouble, it's like chewing with a broken tooth or walking on a lame foot. You see that? Putting confidence in somebody that's unreliable, somebody that's deceptive, somebody that got an undercut thing, crafty, cunning. Notice what it says. If you're in trouble, it's like chewing with a broken tooth or walking on a lame foot, especially when it comes to leaders or preachers and so-called pastors in our day. This is why the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 15, verses 4, whatsoever things are written aforetime was written for our learning. We can learn from the Old Testament. And Solomon is the one that can really teach us and tell us what we should look for regarding lies and deception. Why? Because when he married these wives, they deceived him to turn away from God and his will and his plan. This is why the Bible says, listen to this, people of God, in Proverbs 29, verse 12. Notice what it says. It's on the monitor. If a ruler pays attention to lies and encourages corruption, notice, all of his officials will become wicked. If you go to a church and that pastor, I'm putting it spiritually so you can understand. If that pastor is corrupt, if that pastor is listening to lies, if that pastor is not in truth, then everybody under that pastor, notice what the scripture says, is corrupt. Everybody following him, I don't care how spiritual you are, everybody following him is corrupt. You hear what I'm telling you? If he's corrupt, he got babies in the church. He's about business and money. Hear me, what I'm telling you. If they're not preaching the apostles' doctrine, if they believe a trinity and don't believe there's one God, if they're not telling you to be filled with the Holy Ghost and live a holy life, then understand, everybody under that rulership or under that bishop, under that pastor, all of his servants are wicked. It's wicked. It's wicked. Don't, don't look at me. It's right there. If a ruler pays attention to lies and encourages corruption, how is he encouraging corruption? Because when he's not coming from the book, it's nothing but corruption. Notice all of his officials will become wicked. Don't leave here saying that preacher made that up. You just read. Go back and read it in the KJV, the authorized version. This is why we tell you, come out of the false church. Come out of it. Don't give them another chance. Don't give her another chance. Just come on out. Just put up the finger like we do in church and just walk out and say, excuse me. Excuse me. Don't go back in there again. Amen to that. This is why I tell you, people of God, as we're going home, there's a lot of corruption. This started long ago. 
corruption and deceit and those who really did not love righteousness. They begin to pull away from the word of God. Jesus Christ, God manifested in the flesh. God, who is a spirit. God is a spirit. And they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. What did he do? He formed a body. He overshadowed. That spirit overshadowed Mary. Out came that baby. That baby was named Jesus. God with us. And what did God, that spirit do? That spirit cannot die. It cannot shed blood. That spirit got into that body and dwelt among us and died and shed blood. And understand that Jesus, God in the flesh, he gave it to his disciples, the apostles, the word of God. Telling the world, be my witnesses in Judah, in Judea, in Samaria, and to all the parts of the world. I want you to go and tell them what you should do. They sat with Jesus. They talked to Jesus. They saw what Jesus did. They gave Jesus, they Jesus gave them the word. And when the apostles went off the scene, other different types of denominations and doctrines and teachings came about. You saw people like this man by the name of Joseph Smith. Mormons, founder of the Latter-day Saints, a polygamist who had multiple wives. You say you're trying to dog him. No, I'm telling you what's not true. Then you see what a man by the name of Charles Taz wrestled. The Jehovah Witness, the Watchtowers. You're trying to tell me all of this is Christianity? I mean, all of these ways we can get to heaven? How is it if we don't believe the same thing? There's only one way to God, and that's through Jesus. And he gave it to who? His apostles. And they gave it to the world, which is how it reached us. So if you're a preacher, if you go to a church or you know a church that's not preaching the what would the apostles preach, then I'm telling you, you got to come out of there. If not, you don't desire righteousness. Then you have what is called Joseph Bates. Seven-day Adventist came up with what he believed. Then you have what is called Catholicism. Those that want to bow down and worship Mary. Understand, I don't need to pray to Mary because Mary needed to be saved. Mary needed to be baptized in Jesus' name. Mary needed the Holy Ghost. So take the statue of Mary and that baby down and begin to pray to the one God, Jesus Christ. And then after that, you had the Reformation Protestant churches. This is where you get the Baptist churches, the Church of God in Christ, and all of these other different types of belief. The Methodists, the AME, the Episcopalians, the Anglican churches, the Protestant, the Reformation churches. But the real church and the real doctrine and the real teaching, that which is godly righteousness came from the disciples that they got it from God. And this is what we are to teach. This is why Acts chapter 2 verse 42 says this to us in the scriptures. And they continue steadfastly in what doctrine? The apostles' doctrine. So if the preacher is not preaching the apostles' doctrine, it is not righteousness. It is not of God. It is tradition. It is what they came up with. It is what they came up with. This was not from God. But if you desire righteousness, if you desire truth, you got to love truth so much that if you got to turn away from family, if you got to let go of that relationship, if you got to let go of that boyfriend or girlfriend, you got to love it so much to be able to say, Mama, I love you. But if you don't want this, Mama, I want to be saved. You got to be able to tell Daddy, Daddy, if you don't want this, I want to be saved. If you want to live like this and fake it out, well, then go ahead and fake it. Because there is not going to be no fake Christians and no fake saints in the house of God. God, in the kingdom of God, you got to want this thing. You got to love this thing. You got to come to the house of God. You got to be here to learn, to grow, to be saved. So let us stand. Let me leave you with this. I'll leave you with this last word in the book of instructions. The Bible says in Proverbs 23, verse 23. He says to us, listen, learn the instructions and the wisdom. He says, buy the truth and sell it not. Once you get it, don't you give it up for nobody. Don't you sit there and say, that was a good church. 
but I'm a member and I got I'm in I'm in uh I'm on the choir the praise team. No. Once you get the truth, you buy it and you never give it up. You stay right there. You don't go back to them. You stay right here. Right here at New Life Tabernacle. People get mad when they say, y'all think y'all the only ones? The only ones in Bell Glade in the Glade area. The only ones in the Glade area. The only ones in the Glade area. Come on, let's talk. We will not debate. But you know if your church preaches Acts 2.38. You know if they talk about the apostles' doctrine. You know if they talk about the Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. We don't believe that. They never believe that. They never preached it or taught it. People say, you ain't got to speak in tongues. That's one of the gifts in chapter 12 of Corinthians. Who told you that? What are you reading? Let's sit down and talk so you can really get this thing, so your soul can be saved. Amen to that. Buy the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instructions and understanding. If you're here tonight, we invite you to come. If you're claiming to be a believer, the Bible says this. In Mark 16 and 16, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So don't think just because you're confessing the Lord or you chose the Lord as your personal Savior that you're saved. Yes, faith. But faith without works, it is dead. I'll show you that I have faith by what I do, not what I say. So why don't you say, Lord, I have faith and I believe in you. Let me go down in your name, calling on the name of Jesus Christ. I can show you scripture after scripture where everybody in the New Testament went down in the name of the Lord Jesus. And they never did it in the titles. Don't let a preacher tell you that it means the same thing. It is not. You got to call on the name that's above every name. And if you want the Holy Ghost, you need that too. Call on the name of the Lord Jesus and he'll fill you with his spirit. If you're here today, let's lift up our hands as we go home. We thank God for these instructions and these wisdom. We say to you, come on, the water is ready, it's warm, we have towels and robes. You can get baptized tonight. Do not be ashamed of him or he'll be ashamed of you. Step out and begin to say, Lord, I want to do it tonight because tomorrow is not promised. So let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your grace, your loving kindness. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for the instructions and wisdom. Thank you for teaching us tonight. God is the Holy Ghost that teaches us, God. Father, I ask that you, Lord God, that you will go home with them, God. Let it play over in their minds that they would understand if they want to be saved, you are giving them an opportunity to be saved. But Lord God, tomorrow's not promised, so we ought to get it right now in the name of Jesus. We love you, God. As they leave this place, God, I pray that they'll make it home safely. And give you given us an opportunity to come back, God, this weekend, Saturday or Sunday morning, that we'll be able to come back lifting up our hands in the house of God. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We give you glory. We give you honor. And we give you praise. Let us all say, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Clap your hands. God bless you. We love you. You can go home, Emma, to the education wing. Please go over to the education wing. God bless you we love you we have such such a wonderful treats for you and your children you can go to the education wing but the water is ready if you need to come and be baptized god bless you thank you for being here tonight in jesus name amen tell your brother and sister you're glad to see them tonight